The following is a production of Texas Lutheran University. For more information, please visit tlu.edu. And I have the pleasure of welcoming you to the first Sam and Jenny Seeley Memorial Lecture. Uh, and it's especially great to welcome back to Seguin and TLU Clyde Seeley, uh, who's uh, been such an important part of this community for, for so long. For the past 32 years, Clyde Marvin Seeley, the Seeley family, Structural Metals Incorporated, and CMC Steel have supported TLU and the Guadalupe County Community Symposium, which has brought many programs and activities uh, in support of tolerance and mutual understanding for this community. And tonight's inaugural Seeley Lecture was planned under the leadership of the Guadalupe County Community, uh, community um, uh, Symposium and the, their steering committee. Uh, their chair was Dr. Frank Giesberg. Frank uh, uh, is formerly a professor of economics and dean at Texas Lutheran. And he can't be here this evening, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, Norm Beck will be here to represent him and to introduce members of the steering committee. Uh, so we're very pleased this evening to welcome our inaugural speaker, Josh Gunderson, uh, and to launch what we hope will be an annual lecture that will enrich our community and honor the name of Sam and Jenny Seeley. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Norm Beck, who has shepherded this program and symposium for so many years for so well. So Dr. Beck, thank you. I want to add appreciation to Texas Lutheran University for sponsoring the symposium and this event this evening. Also to the Brown Cultural Enrichment uh, uh, Fund and Committee for providing some of the resources for this evening and most of all for the Guadalupe County Community Symposium. Just uh, to add a sentence or two to what uh, President Dorsey has said, the, the idea of the symposium began uh, in 1980 at a lunch for Marvin Selig and then President Charles Ostrike and then Vice President for Academic Affairs, Frank Giesper. And they were talking together about what SMI, Structural Metals Incorporated, and the Selig family could do to accomplish here in the community uh, what they were doing at SMI, bringing together people with great diversity, working together to produce a product that they could be proud of and benefit everyone in the community. And so the idea began at that time. And Dr. Frank Giesper uh, and, uh, and Clarence Little, who is sitting here, and I have been on the steering committee uh, for 32 years. And we have been joined uh, more recently by Dolly Arambula for about half that time, and Sidney Burton, who will introduce our speaker in just a moment and more recently by Van Bui. And so we uh, partner with other groups to bring to the community and the county programs, symposia, and ideas that will foster appreciation for each other and a better community. At this time, I'm going to introduce Sidney Burton, who has done most of the work to make the arrangements for this evening's program and the programs in the public schools the next two days. And she will introduce Josh Gunderson. Sydney. Greetings. Tonight, we're pleased to welcome Josh Gunderson to Seguin and to Guadalupe County and to TLU. Josh has appeared on MTV, Comedy Central, and Bravo. He's done numerous charity comedy tours and has a regular sketch on the web series, The Bob Show. Over the past two years, he's educated and entertained thousands of students, teachers, and parents across North America. He is a recipient of the John Sorensen Unsung Hero Award. Over the next two days, Josh is going to be giving his high energy program to sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students in the Seguin and Marion schools. But tonight, he brings his wit and his wisdom to us. Please, if you will, be sure to turn off your cell phones. 
and join me in welcoming Josh Gunderson. I'm really, really excited to be here. I, uh, I have to tell you a little bit about my weekend, though, because I have the microphone and I'm in charge. So I, I live in the Boston area, and one of my favorite things to do, I volunteer at the New England Aquarium in Boston, and I've had a really funny weekend, because at the New England Aquarium, we have a lot of penguins. We pride ourselves on our penguins. And they're right in this big open area, right when you walk in the building, and I was standing on the floor, and this woman came up to me, and she's like, excuse me, excuse me. I have a question. I was like, oh, I'd love to help you answer that. What can I do for you? I see you have a lot of penguins here. Yes, we do. We have over 80 penguins representing three different species. That's good. That's good. That's good. Um, here's my question. They're in a big open space. Yeah? Well, how do you keep them from flying away? <laughs> I thought she was kidding. She wasn't. I was like, I'm sorry? She's like, you've got a lot of penguins. How do you keep them from flying away? Oh, they, penguins can't fly. You clip their wings. No, no, their bones are really dense and they can't, I have to go this way now. <laughs> I had to share that because it was just so ridiculous. And I, I, I looked at my friend who was standing next to me, I was like, did that just really happen? Was that a thing? That was a thing, that was a thing that happened. But I'm not here today to talk about penguins. I am here to talk to you about the wonderful world of the internet. It's one of my favorite things in the world. I think the internet is so cool. There's all these really great ways to connect with each other, to talk to one another. And I'm someone that travels a lot. So being able to really connect with the world around me is something that I enjoy being able to do. But before I really get into it, I always like to talk about where it all came from. Because we have to always remember, there was a time we didn't have the internet. I know, it was scary. It was a frightening time, it was a dark time. We had to send letters and we had to hand write them. Oh, memories. And it reached the point where, you know, we looked around the world around us and we only had two ways of really communicating, really two ways of sharing information. One of them is through the telephone. Now, if you're like me and grew up in the 80s, the phone usually lived in the kitchen and it, for some reason, only came in two colors, sort of like an off-white and then like a, I guess like a baby puke green, I don't know how to, olive, I guess it was. My mom still has the full set. She's got that disgusting green stove and the fridge and the phone. I'm trying to get her to upgrade one day. But we had the phone and that's how we shared information. That was good. And we also had the television. And this was at a time when the news was on once a day. And if you missed it, oh well. Now we've got 24-7 news. It's depressing. <laughs> and the government, at, this was around the time when the government had ideas and they woke up from their nap one day and said, what happens if we lose the phone? If we lose the television, how are we going to share information? How are we going to stay in touch with each other? And they decided, why not try talking through those computer things? Now, we all have to remember computers weren't always this tiny. They were like the size of this room. And that's how we they said, all right, we'll talk through that. And so a system was created, the early internet. And it started off as that government communication network and soon opened up to colleges and universities to share research and information. And then it became the internet that we knew growing up, growing up with AOL and dial-up. Do y'all remember dial-up? That, that was a terrible, terrible time. I can't stand near a fax machine anymore. I hear that thing go off, I curl up in the fetal position and cry a little bit. <sighs> now we've got the fast stuff. I, I just got Verizon Fios hooked up in my apartment. Oh, it's wonderful. I'm never home to use it, but it's really great. <laughs> and it is, it's, it's really cool. It's, it's changed the way that we've connected with each other. Now going online means something completely different from what it even meant about 10 years ago. We've now got things like our laptops. I carry my laptop with me, it's in my backpack over there, and it amazes me every day the things my laptop can do. It's got that built-in webcam so I can Skype and be paranoid that my webcam's on and people are watching me sing along to my iTunes playlist. I'm afraid it's happening. Somewhere out there is footage of me singing, I don't know, Baby Got Back, and it's just ugly. <laughs> and then we got things like our cell phones, and cell phones have changed so much, and it's been so amazing all they can do. Gaming has changed. I grew up with an Atari, and with the Atari, you could play with the person sitting next to you, and it was usually my sister, and she cheated. <laughs> How do you cheat at Atari? Atari, really simple. When someone's winning that's not you, you hit the reset button. <laughs> I haven't forgiven her to this day. 
And then we've got even crazy sci-fi. Like, I grew up with Star Trek. I remember looking at all those gadgets thinking, oh, man, that's so cool. I wonder if we'll ever have them. And then the iPad came along. Now, I don't have an iPad, and I should probably start off by saying this. If you came here tonight looking for technological advice, wrong guy. Wrong guy. I'm on my third laptop in a year. Yeah. I, I showed up with the, at the Geek Squad at Best Buy last time I broke it. The guy was like, what'd you do? I was like, I tried to turn it on. I swear, that's all I did. He took it away from me. If my laptop were a child, DSS would have been called in a long time ago. My phone's the same way. If it were a child, they would, have, they would have gladly taken it away from me. It's been dropped, kicked, thrown, dropped in a toilet twice. Um, I don't want to talk about it. But it's really cool. There's all the ways that we're able to connect in there, all the things that we can do with this technology. So I'm going to, uh, it's time to ask the audience. I want to know what all of you are up to because I walked around a little bit while you're all filing in and I saw you on your phones. Some Facebook updates, some Foursquare check-ins, some texting, hopefully about me. This guy looks awesome. He looks like a Jonas brother. Knock it off. That's me. <laughs> I have feeling. Just the one. And so all the things, I want to know what you're up to. How many of you are on Facebook, MySpace, Blogger, LiveJournal, Tumblr? Go ahead and raise your hands. Don't be ashamed. It's dark. No one else can see you but me and whoever's sitting next to you. All right, a few of you. Awesome. And how about Googling whenever you're like doing research or anything like that? I love Google, only because for my own entertainment, it's awesome. My favorite Google story, my mom one day, she's a crazy person, so we're going to talk a lot about her. She was decided to Google all her kids' names. She's got four primary kids, so her four kids, and she decided to Google all of us just to see what she could find. Now, my younger brother, nothing. Well, maybe an arrest record, but we won't talk about that. She will not go there. My older sister, nothing. My little sister, not so much. Me, I'm dead. Oh, yeah. Best phone call ever. <laughs> I was on the road. It was my first year touring, and I was down in New Jersey, and she calls me, and I see it on the display, and so I answer, hey, mom, what's up? Are you okay? I'm, I'm cool. What's going on? Are you in Mexico? I'm in New Jersey. It's just as bad. <laughs> uh, I went there. I went there. I'm sorry, when Jersey Shore hit the air, it was downhill for those people. I, I kid, I've met the cast of Jersey Shore. Snooki is roughly this tall. And she's a sweetheart. She just had a baby. I haven't seen pictures yet because I have a life, but I assume it looks like the Cloverfield monster. I went there. And so I was like, Mom, no, that's not me. It turns out someone the same exact name. And I love Google, because whenever I'm doing research, whenever I want to learn new things, I Google it up. And then, of course, we got things like our iPods. How many of you have your iPods, iPads, iPhones? Anyone still walking around with a cassette deck? Nope. All right, moving on. And then gaming. Oh, gaming is awesome. I've got the old school NES up there, but I've, I've you know, graduated on to things like the Xbox and the PS3. I'm awful at it, but I love it. And then last but not least, how many of you just cannot live without your cell phones? And I better see hands in the air because I saw all your cell phones. That's what I thought. And it is really great. And it's really cool, all these things that we have and all these ways that we can stay connected. But the problem is we're too connected. We've gotten a little bit too used to each other's company at all hours of the day and night. And it's really great. It's a great way to stay connected. I love being able to stay in touch with my family. I share pictures when I'm on the road. I stopped by, what is it, Bucky's? What's going on with that, by the way? <laughs> I have questions. Lots of them. There is a giant beaver statue out in front of the store. <laughs> yes, I had my picture taken with him. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> but really, moving on. And it is really cool. The problem is we, we are really connected. It's led to a lot of issues. And one of the biggest issues is how we're interacting with each other. And it's gone from really, really positive to really, really negative really, really fast. And the issue of, of bullying and cyberbullying has grown so much, especially over the last few years, that it's been really scary. And so a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about tonight are these stories, the things that are going on in the world around us. And I, I'll let you know right now, I don't have all the answers. I really wish I did. My goal tonight is to educate you as much as possible, give you the tools, give you the knowledge that you can go on, share it with others, and hopefully continue to grow and learn more. 
I wish I could give you all the answers. A lot of times I come into communities and they're like, he's going to save us. No, no, I'm going to try. And so I'm going to give you information. I'm going to give you knowledge. And what you do with that is, again, all entirely up to you. And hopefully you will take it on, share it with others, and we can work to end this and put a stop to it. But for now, this is a lot of what's going on in the world. Now, my first story here comes out of Seattle, Washington, where a group of students thought it'd be really funny to create a hate page for one of the girls in their class. A sixth grade girl, she was a little bit overweight. She didn't you know, have the greatest hairstyle, the most fashionable clothes. So they created this page on Facebook about how awful she was. And they went on every single day and posted their comments and said their things, and she found this page. And she watched day after day as these kids were posting these nasty comments, sometimes complete strangers, people she didn't even go to school with. And it just ate her up inside. But she kept it to herself, and she said nothing. And it got worse and worse, and it, she finally reached her breaking point when one day after their gym class, she was in the locker room changing. One of the girls in her class snapped a photo of her and uploaded it to the page. They started posting all these nasty comments, saying these nasty things with this really inappropriate photo of her. And she started making herself very sick. She stopped eating. When she did eat anything, she made sure to throw it up afterwards, and she ended up in the hospital. Now, thankfully for her, she got the help that she needed. The kids that created the page were expelled from school. The kids that participated in it were suspended. Facebook deleted the page. But it's not gone. Something a lot of people don't realize, the internet is it's permanent. It doesn't go anywhere. So those comments, those photos, they could still be out there somewhere. And that's a nightmare that she may have to relive over and over again throughout her life. But thankfully, she did get that help that she needed. And for her, this story had a happy ending. But as we get more into it, we realize they're, they're the not-so-happy endings. There's more and more going on in the world. Now, I have here a somewhat local story for you. This happened in 2006 in Plano, Texas. And this is actually used in a lot of case studies when it comes to the cyber world. Now, in this story, some student athletes thought it'd be really funny to create a fake MySpace page for one of their coaches. Using his real name, using his real photo, they created this profile and started adding their fellow students. Now, it started off innocent enough. But, like most things, it started to take a turn for worse, the worse. And pretty soon, they were posting really inappropriate things, saying some really not so great things. And as far as anyone knew, it was this coach that was doing it. So it was this coach that almost lost his job. This coach had almost lost his job in a way that guaranteed he was never going to work in education again. Now, thankfully for him, it was found out that it was these student athletes. Four of them played baseball, one ran track. Star athletes who lost out on a lot of opportunities. They were kicked off their teams, they were punished on the school level. One of the biggest questions that came up in this case, and it's why it's something that's talked about a lot, is what right the school had. Was this really an issue? In reality, it very much was. If this coach wanted to, he could have pressed identity <coughs> theft charges. When you go online and you represent yourself as somebody else, either by creating a fake page or even logging on to your friend's page and posting comments as them, You've committed identity fraud. And it's something that's in a lot of debate right now. Because the internet's still a big gray area. We're still figuring it out. Yeah, it's been around for quite some time. But this new way of connecting, the social networking, hasn't been around for all that long. It's still about less than a decade old. We started off with sites like Friendster. We started moving on to MySpace. And then we killed MySpace when Facebook came on. And then Justin Timberlake bought MySpace, thinking that would be a good idea. It wasn't. And it's, it's, it's really great these ways we can connect, but we have to look at the bad that we're doing. Because in this story, somebody almost lost their job. More and more of what's happening out there are people losing their lives. Now, this story here comes out of South Hadley, Massachusetts. It's a small community about an hour and a half south of where I live. Young girl, Phoebe Prince, moved to the United States from Ireland with her family and started attending South Hadley High School. Now, there is a whole lot that went on in this story, but the one thing that really stood out for me the one thing that served as a catalyst that set everything in motion was Phoebe Prince was asked out to a dance. An older popular senior guy asked her out to the homecoming dance and she of course was flattered and said, sure, why not? And a group of girls decided they didn't like that. Why is this new girl, this freshman girl, getting asked out by the older popular senior guy? So they decided to do something about it. They got a hold of her cell phone number, found her on MySpace and Facebook, started sending her really nasty messages, posting really inappropriate things, making obscene phone calls, shoving her around in the hallways, and it reached a point where she couldn't take it anymore. 
On the day of her death, Phoebe Prince was walking home from school. A group of girls drove by her, started calling her really nasty names, started throwing things at her. She went home that day and she ended her life. But it didn't stop there. When the school made the announcement about what had happened, one of these girls, one of these bullies, logged onto Facebook from her phone and updated her status to mission accomplished. Think about it, all of that because of an invitation to a dance. These are the ways that we're connecting with each other. These are the ways that we're treating each other. And it's gotten really scary. And I, I can't help but look at stories like this and wonder, who else saw this? Who said nothing? Who let it happen? And so again, it's just taking that time to think. Think about that world around us and what's going on. Now this story here comes out of Rutgers University in New Jersey. Young guy, 18-year-old Tyler Clemente, was just starting off out on his own, finally for the first time, getting ready to experience the world. And within his world, he had a secret. And that secret is that he was gay. And that's something he really kept to himself. He wasn't really ready to go out to the world with it. And he lived his life. Now, he lived in the dorms, of course, and with that comes roommates. And one day, he asked his roommate, hey, I have a friend coming over tonight. Where it's, you know, it's a date. And I'd really like to have some privacy. Can we have the room? And his roommate said, sure, why not? But privacy wasn't something his roommate had in mind. He set up the webcam on his computer to broadcast everything going on in the room. And he tweeted a link to that broadcast to all of his friends. And so people watched their date. And that was broadcast for the entire world to see. And this happened twice. And after the second time, Tyler found out about it. And he was shamed. He was embarrassed. He didn't know what to do. This was something he wasn't ready to deal with. And he was now outed to the entire world. So that's something that goes out there and cannot be taken back. It is permanent. And that's something I can never stress enough. It's just how permanent it is. Once you hit that send button, it's out there. And it is out there forever. And so he didn't know what to do. He was alone. He was lost. He was scared. And he drove up to New York City, parked his car, walked out over the George Washington Bridge, and he jumped. 18-year-old Tyler Clemente ended his life. People saw this happening. People saw that tweet. They saw that link. They said nothing. They just laughed and joked along, not taking the time to really think about the consequences, how this one joke could affect somebody's entire life. It's, again, taking that time to think and understanding that are we all going to get along as human beings? Absolutely not. It's never going to happen. But it's recognizing that we are human beings. We're all living, breathing entities that have hopes and dreams for our future. Tyler did. And he lost out on that. Not only because somebody was being mean, but people sat and watched it happen. And one of the things that I always stress to every school I go to, every community I talk to, is if you see it happening, and you say nothing, you do nothing, even if you're not actively involved, you are still responsible. You are just as guilty as that bully. Because somebody could have stood up and said, hey, don't do that. You wouldn't want that done to you but they kept silent. So it's really thinking about each other and how this is affecting the world around us. Because it's not just the person being bullied. It is their family, it is their friends, it is the people left behind. But it's taking that time to think. Now, everywhere I go, I share my top tips for tackling bullies. And it's fun to say, because there's a lot of teas in there. <coughs> but this is the advice that was given to me when I was young. Because in the middle of my high school career, I moved from California to Massachusetts and I got made fun of a lot, most of the time for the way that I talked. I had a little bit of an accent. I got into theater to get rid of that accent, but oh, they just ate it up. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard anyone from Boston talk. They have no room <coughs> to make fun of anybody else. <laughs> oh, but they did. They loved it. They loved hearing me talk. If I had a dollar for every time someone in the hallway would be like, hey, 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 weird kid, weird kid, come here, come here, really? Weird kid. This is going to be good. Say pack the cat in the habit, yeah. What? <laughs> pack the cat in the habit, yeah. Do you need the nurse? What's happening? <laughs> oh, but they loved it because I was the weird kid. I talked weird. I dressed weird. I sounded weird. Everything about me was just weird. Wicked weird. 
I didn't follow sports. I knew nothing about the Red Sox. I'm sorry, I'm not a football fan. I don't get it. <laughs> That's Red Sox, right? Bruins, Bruins, I'm sorry. Is that a thing? I'm just going to stop talking. So this is the advice that was given to me. This is the advice that I like to share. This goes for everybody. It's not just students. It's everybody out there that feels like it's them, that they're getting picked on. So this is the advice that I like to share. This is the advice that I use, and I think it worked well. I turned out decent. We were talking earlier about, I, I met Melissa McCartney a couple months ago, and the way we met was I was in Target talking to bed sheets. None of you do that? Moving on. First, when it comes to bullies, is don't respond. Bullies love a response. Whether they're little kids or grown adults, they love to know that they have power over you. They love to know that they can get underneath your skin. But when you don't respond, when you just walk away, you get to be the better person in that situation. You get to hold on to that power. You get to be strong. So just walk away. And it's one of the hardest things in the world to do because every instinct in our body says, I need to get back at them. I need, to, I need to make a snappy comment back. I need to do something. The best something you can do is silence. Oh, it's a wonderful weapon. My family uses it constantly on each other. I love it. Because you don't want to retaliate. You don't want to put yourself in a position where you're going to get in trouble as well, where you're going to get labeled that bully, where you're going to get labeled a mean person. And again, I know it's our every instinct. They started it. I'm going to finish it. Don't put yourself in that position. Because that just gets you in trouble. That gets you labeled. And it's, it's a hard thing to do. I still have trouble with it. Like I, I mentioned, I, I work at the New England Aquarium. It's a lot of fun. I deal with a lot of customer service stuff. And you know what? Some customers are evil and don't know a thing about penguins. It's very frustrating. <laughs> and a lot of times when they're arguing with me, they want to bait me. And it's don't pick up that rope. Don't get into that tug-of-war game. That's what it all is. Every argument we ever have, somebody's throwing us a rope, and they want you to pick it up, and they want you to tug. Don't pick up the rope. Teach yourself to do that. Again, it's really hard. I'm still learning. But you don't pick up that rope, it's going to make your life a lot easier. Next, save the evidence. The great thing about all this online stuff today is the evidence is right there. You can print out emails. You can save text messages. That way, if you're having a problem, whew, there it is. You never have to worry about it. That way you have something that you can take higher, something that you can say, hey, you know what? This is what's going on. Block the bully. Oh, technology today is wonderful. If you don't want someone talking to you, you block them. I do it all the time, sometimes just for funsies. I'll find a random person on Facebook, be like, oh, hello, John Smith, blocked. Grandma, get out of here. <laughs> do not tell her I said that. No, I'm just, it's, nothing scares me more than that woman, including spiders. No, ooh, you have no idea. Do not tell her I said that. But block them. Get them out of there. I, Sally Mae calls me constantly. I've blocked her. Do not tell her I said that. She wants her money. <laughs> Someday, Sally. But block them. Get the phones allow you to do it. You don't want someone calling you? You block them. Facebook, block them. MySpace, block them. Xbox, block them. Oh, it is so much fun. Take advantage of that. Oh, I, if I could do it right now, I'd block somebody. I'd pull up my phone and be like, ha ah, blocked, mom. <laughs> I love my family, I really do, I promise you. But next, talk about it. And I've noticed this about myself. When I'm having problems sometimes, I won't, I won't say anything. I, I let it fester. But talk about it. Go to somebody. There's always somebody to talk to. I'll, I'll call up my mom and say, hey, mom, I'm having a problem. You should make meatloaf for me. And she says, no, you're a grown adult. Make your own meatloaf. Mine's better. But talk about it. Call up a friend. Call up family. Don't just let it eat away at you. There is always somebody to talk to. I can guarantee that. So go to them. Talk to them. Let somebody know what's going on. Let somebody help you. Because a lot of times I look at these stories and I can't help but wonder, was there really no one? And sometimes it can feel that way. There was a lot of times growing up I felt like I was alone. I felt like I had no one I could turn to. There always is. Speak up and say something. Let somebody help you. Don't let it, yourself get so far down that path that you feel like there's nowhere else to go. There's always a light at the end of the tunnel. I absolutely promise you that. And then I like to talk about be a friend, not a bystander. So like I said, if you see something happening, whether it's online or in the real world, you do nothing, you say nothing, 
even if it feels like just friendly joking around. To somebody else, it might not seem that way. So stand up and say something. Don't just let it happen. And take that time to think. Because we don't always know everybody's full story. We may see people in passing at Costco. Don't worry about it. We see each other in passing in the hallways, at school, in life, whatever. We don't know what else is going on. So that kid that you call stupid, you have no idea that he has a learning disability. And it took him two hours last night to do the homework that may have taken you 10 minutes. Or that girl whose outfit you made fun of, you have no idea how long she spent the night before agonizing over what to wear in hopes that today was the day that she would get a compliment. Or the kid that you shove around in the hallway, you have no idea he's getting enough abuse at home. You don't know what else is going on in somebody's life. So take that time to think. The next time you're tempted to gossip about somebody, spread a rumor about somebody, think about Phoebe Prince. <coughs> think about the faces that you see in front of you right now, because these, ladies and gentlemen, are the faces of bullying. These are boys and girls, kids, kids, that have ended their lives because they were hurt and harassed and picked on because of how they dressed, the color of their skin, how they did their hair, or who they fell in love with. Now, I love my job. I have the greatest job in the entire world. I really do. I get to travel all over. I get to meet new people. One thing I absolutely 100% cannot stand is I can't go one single week without another story like one of these coming across my desk. Just two days ago, not even, the story of a young girl from Canada who a few weeks before had posted an anti-bullying video online. A few weeks after posting that video, she ended her life. It, it, it kills me. Because I, I've traveled all over, I've talked to thousands of people, and I wonder, what am I not doing? Because each and every one of these stories affects me. One of them, one of the hardest that I've ever had here, second row down, second picture in, Seth Walsh, young kid from California, who very early on came out to his mom and his brother, it was just the three of them living together, he said, Mom, brother, I'm gay. They're like, cool. Kids at school, not so much. And one of the reasons why this story is so hard to even think about is when I finally heard everything that went on that day, it was from the mouth of his younger brother. And what happened was, Seth had gone to the park with a friend and a group of kids had surrounded him and were shoving him around and calling him names and he was so scared to even walk home he had to call his mom for a ride. And he got home that day and his mom was getting dinner ready in the kitchen and his brother said to him, Seth, do you want to you know, hang out and play a video game or something while mom's getting dinner ready? And Seth said, no, I really want to be alone right now. And he went into his room for a little while and he went out to the backyard. And while his mom was making dinner, she looked up at one point to see Seth hanging from a tree in the backyard. And his younger brother, his younger brother climbed up that tree to cut his body down. And, and that is something that he is going to live with for the rest of his life. Holding his brother's body, watching him slip away each day in the hospital, remembering him dying. Take that time to think. Those kids certainly didn't. They didn't think about the lives that they were affecting. The friends, the family. It's, it's understanding that this is an entire world we're talking about, and this keeps happening. And I've, I've thought about it more and more, and I always think to myself, what am I not doing? What am I not saying? Am I not saying it loud enough? Am I not being serious enough about it? And I've realized something, that I'm, I'm doing absolutely everything I can. In the end, it's up to you, as a community, to stand up and take action. Because I could talk to you all night long. I really could. Oh, I could. Local law enforcement, politicians, whoever, they can all talk, but it's just talk. It takes a community to come together and take action and say, absolutely not. Not here. Not in our family. So do that. Help each other out. Stand up and say, we're not going to take it. Then it's also understanding it's not just kids committing this crime. 
One story came out of 2006, the story of Megan Meyer. Now at 13 years old, which is the minimum age to sign up for a social networking site, Megan signed up for MySpace, and pretty soon she received a message from a 16-year-old boy. This kid said that he was just moved into a new town, he was being homeschooled, and he didn't have a phone or anything that he could talk her with, so MySpace was the only way they could communicate with each other. And they got to talking and sharing a lot of personal stuff. But on October 15th of that year, the tone of those boys' messages changed. And he started getting really nasty with her. And one of the messages he sent to her was, I don't know if I want to be friends with you anymore because I heard you're not very nice to your friends. And she picked up that rope. And she fought back. And over the next day or so, they started going back and forth, having really nasty conversations with each other. And it escalated to the point where on October 16th, she received this final message from him. He said to her, everybody in O'Fallon, the town he said he was from, knows how you are. You're a bad person and everybody hates you. Have a horrible rest of your life. The world would be a better place without you. To which she replied, you're the type of boy a girl would kill herself over. 20 minutes later, her mom found her hanging dead in her closet. This 16-year-old boy turned out to be a 40-year-old woman. Megan and her daughter had been friends, and they stopped being friends for whatever reason. It happens in middle school. And with the help of her assistant, she created this fake page and started baiting Megan, getting her to tell her personal information, which she was then feeding into her daughter, who was spreading it all around the school. And they tormented her. They tormented her into taking her own life. So it's recognizing that it's not just those younger generations. It's the older ones as well. Because we feel so safe and protected by our computer screens that we can turn it off and it all just goes away. The thing that drives me nuts about this story is at the time, again, internet was a huge gray area. She didn't get arrested. There was no charges to the press because what laws were there? She walked away with a slap on the wrist. She basically committed murder and got away with it. So it's again, taking that time to think about how we're interacting with the world around us, how we're utilizing this wonderful technology in sometimes really bad ways and understanding the harm that we are causing. And so what can, parents, what can we do as a community? Again, and I'm going to put this out there for you now, I don't, I don't have kids. I have two cats, which is kind of like raising kids. Probably worse, if we're being honest. I'm serious. My oldest one last night got herself stuck under my bed. When's the last time you had a one-year-old stuck under your bed? Hopefully never. There's some phone calls that need to be made. So all of my advice, especially when it comes to parenting, comes from how I was raised. And I think my mom did a pretty great job. I came out relatively normal-ish. And so here's what I think we do, not only as parents, but as a community. First, never overreact. For you parents in the room, hardest thing in the world to do. Because when your kid comes to you and tells you that something bad's happening, you, you turn into the Hulk. I've seen it happen. <laughs> but don't do that because I, I remember as a kid, my mom would always stay calm. If there was a problem, she would sit down and listen to us. And then the first question out of her mouth would be, what do you want to do? How do you want to proceed? And I loved that about her because I knew she wasn't going to fly off the handle. I knew I didn't have to worry about what she was going to do. <coughs> All I could imagine is her showing up with like rollers and a rolling pin at the school in her nightgown. I don't think she owns, I don't think she's ever rolled her hair, but she'd do it for the occasion. And then keep a log. Same as with, you know, if it's happened to you, keep that evidence. Know what's going on. Keep a log of it. So that way, if you are having a problem, you know what to do. Consider contacting parents first. And I know there are some crazy parents out there. I've seen Here Comes Honey Boo Boo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, just, no, we're just going to leave it there. I can't even get started. But try talking to each other first. I think a lot, especially now, a lot of pressure is put on schools to raise our kids for us. Again, I say our kids, I mean yours. But consider talking to each other first. See what you do. If that doesn't work, contact the school. If anything, just to let them know what's going to be knocking on their front door. Take it higher if you have to. Keep on going up that ladder until action is taken. And then share knowledge. Again, my hope is to enlighten all of you to give you this information and continue to take it out and share it with everybody so you can have that safe community so you don't ever have to experience what others have had to experience. So continue to share that. Stay knowledgeable about what's going on in the world around you. Keep tabs on it. 
Know what's happening to see if you can prevent it, to see if you can get ahead of it. Pay attention. Look for these signs. This goes for every single one of us. Because I've seen my friends hurt. I've seen them bullied. I've seen it happen to myself. Look for it. Help each other out. Because again, I can't help but wonder, where was everybody when these people were being hurt? Where were their friends? Where were their family? Connect with each other. Find out what's going on. You know, if you've got kids or friends or even hesitant to be online, nervous when instant messages, text messages, anything like that shows up, somebody who's normally jumping right on top of it, they start to hesitate if it looks like something else is going on, talk about it. Speak up and say, hey, are you okay? Let's figure this out together. They become visibly upset after using the computer, cell phone, suddenly start avoiding technology altogether. We're all connected today. We've got our phones on us. We've got our computers. Suddenly we're starting to avoid it. We're not updating as much. Might be a sign something's going on. Might be a sign that it's finals or midterms and things are crazy. But it might be a sign of something else. Pay attention to each other. Find out what's going on. Hides or clears the computer screen. Now this might mean a couple things. Let's be realistic. (laughs) I didn't say anything. Y'all went there. Okay. Putting that out there right now. <laughs> Just going to move on to the next one. I can't. Withdraws from friends, falls behind to schools, wants to avoid school altogether. All of a sudden, you've got a star performer that is falling behind, that is avoiding faking sick, avoiding social situations. It might be a sign of something else going on. Suddenly, sullen, evasive, withdrawn, a huge change in personality. We're all friends. A lot of you probably see each other every day. You hang out a lot. Jump out of your bubble. Jump out of yourself once in a while and pay attention to what's going on. A good friend of mine very recently started very much withdrawing from all of us. Started pulling away. I finally called him up and I said, hey, let's grab dinner. You're paying. <laughs> that didn't work. And I said, hey, I, you know, I've noticed you're not you know, online as much. We usually play our video games together because someone's got to teach me how to do it. What's going on? And it turns out he wasn't having a really good time in school. He was really struggling. He was getting really stressed out. He was worried about finding a job. And we talked about it, and it made him feel a whole lot better. So we talked to each other. Pay attention to what's going on. And that meant putting a few things on hold for me. I canceled an evening of plans to be with my friend to make sure that everything was okay. I put my life on hold to check in on him. So do that for each other. Help each other out. And then typical things, these are also signs of traditional bullying. Trouble sleeping, loss of appetite, moody, crying, depressed. Pay attention to these things. Again, we're all so busy in our own worlds. Facebook has turned us all into little celebrities. We post our status and we want to know right away, has anyone liked it? Has anyone commented? Pull away from yourself and pay attention to each other. Because we've all become so wrapped up in our technology that we've forgotten that the entire world does exist. It's right there. And then last but not least in there, oh, I hit the wrong button, I'm sorry. That's not supposed to happen. There we go. Suspicious phone calls, emails, and packages. And a lot of people look at me like I'm weird when I say this. When the internet first started really becoming what the internet is, and I was in high school, all of a sudden I started getting weird, I'm not going to go into detail, but painfully inappropriate mail. Like, really bad stuff. And I'm not the one that got the mail in the afternoon. It was my mom, and she had questions. (laughs) Yeah. Somebody was signing me up for this stuff putting my name, putting my address out there. Something like that starts happening. It might be a sign of something else going on. And as it turns out, that's when the whole thing with the kids shoving me around and being like, hey, hey, wicked weird kid, come here. All that was happening. And it got out there. And she had enough foresight to say, hey, let's talk about this before it turns into a bigger issue. So it's paying attention to all of that. Then there's understanding the law. Now, Texas, within the last year, did pass a brand new anti-bullying law. This went into effect September 1st of 2012. There's a watchdog organization called BullyPolice.org, and it's led by a woman named Brenda Hyde, who unfortunately, her son Jared is one of the photos that you saw up there today, and she has taken action. She saw what happened to her son, and she said, no more. And she currently, I believe, resides in California, and she travels around the country talking about her story. And she created this organization to put pressure on each state to bring in new laws. To say, hey, you know what? This is an issue, and we want to talk about it. Now, the last time I was in Texas, and someday I'll remember exactly where that was, your score was not that good. Not that good at all. 
it was like it was like not even D for diploma good. Like it was it was down there. I'm very happy to say that bullypolice.org rated your brand new bullying law with an A plus plus. Good for you. Massachusetts was there first, just putting it out there. Yeah. Yeah, we won the Super Bowl at some point. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but A++, and I want you to understand that law, especially what this new law says. I'm not going to read the whole law to you. It is really <coughs> long. I read it on my plane ride this morning. Had a very good nap. Thank you. <laughs> um, but if you do want to read the law, it is available at bullypolice.org. That is, um, the original law is at bullypolice.org, the new one, because it is still um, getting updated and all that, hasn't been posted yet, but a quick Google search will pull it up for you. Um, I believe stopbullying.gov has a copy of it as well. But here are some of the highlights from this new law. It establishes a new bullying definition and includes electronic means. A lot of early on bullying laws in all of our states didn't have electronics as a part of it. That's why it was such a gray area. That's why when things like this were happening, we all just kind of went, uh, now it's put on there. It is now on the books as cyber issues are now a part of this law. Integrates awareness, prevention, identification, resolution, and oh, it's just, just so much. There's a lot of words out there. Basically, it's integrating this into schools now, saying you need to have this as part of your curriculum, understanding this, learning about it, helping each other out, and realizing that bullying is a big issue. Now, one of the biggest things that drives me nuts about my stepdad is he was raised, you know, a while ago, and he at one point just got stuck in the 50s. He's still there. So if I hear one more time about the price of gas when he was my age, I'm going to hit him. <laughs> and I know that's not nice to say, but if you met this man, you'd want to hit him too. <laughs> I love my family, I promise. <laughs> Drive me nuts. And his big thing, we got, I, I make the mistake of getting into conversations with him, which normally revolve around model trains, but there was a story on the news about bullying, and he and I got into it, and he said, it is just kids being kids. Okay, Larry, do you know what being a kid entails? Because it's not walking uphill both ways and, you know, three feet of snow with no shoes on anymore. We have scooters. <laughs> and kids being kids. And that's what it was. It was shoving each other around in the hallways, calling each other's names, getting thrown into a trash can. That happened to me once. It's not like on TV. You don't plop out with a banana peel on your head. No, it's usually yogurt. <coughs> Strawberry, if I remember correctly, with the fruit on the bottom. And it ends up just dripping down your face. High school was a pleasant time. But it's changed. It's not just kids being kids. And it's because of how connected we all are. Because it's not just in the hallways, it's 24-7, it's on Facebook, it's on YouTube, it is all over. Kids being kids, that mentality has to go away. And that's why these changing laws are fantastic and why I encourage them. And I really want every state to look at this. Because unfortunately not every state is in the A++ range. A lot of them are still revolving around Fs and D minuses. So again, good on you. Massachusetts was there first. Provides local school boards with discretion to transfer a student found to have bullied to another classroom or to another cam campus when consulting the parent or guardian. It now gives schools that power. And that's fantastic because before you didn't really have that. And now you have that option. So again, that is something awesome. And I, I'm going to be honest, Massachusetts doesn't have that. So you win that one. Requires local school districts to adopt and implement a bullying policy that recognizes minimum guidelines such as prohibition of bullying, providing counseling options, and establishing procedures for reporting an incidence of bullying. A lot of schools today, I've, you know, I did a search of a lot of your schools around your state. It's a big state. Did you know that? It's huge. Stop it. <laughs> Just I, cut yourselves in half. Let's be honest. We'll call it New Texas. It'll be awesome. I have that power. But a lot of schools, what they've done is they've posted a link on their website where kids can anonymous, anonymously report. Wow, I got that word out. Anonymously report bullying. Something and that's really, really great. And a lot of schools are now implementing this. They had to as of September 1st. And some schools, unfortunately, have done the bare minimum. Other schools have 
gone above and beyond. So it's really, really great that a lot of people are taking this seriously. And again, good on you for that, really learning and understanding that. I need to stop pushing that button. <laughs> and a lot of what it comes down to is how much access we're giving to all these people. Because again, there's all these great new ways for us to stay connected. There's Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, MySpace, Blogger, LiveJournal, Club Penguin. It is awesome out there. No one Club Penguins? Just me. And it's how we're connecting with one another, because here's the reality of it when it comes to the world that we are living in. Today, about 70% of college admissions officers are searching for their potential applicants online. They want to see what kind of person you are. They want to see how they're going to represent your school. And this is going to continue on into master's program, doctorate programs. They want to see how you're going to represent yourself, and they're going to take that to how you're going to represent the school that you're applying to. About 60% of employers are doing the exact same thing. So for a lot of you, as you're getting older and getting ready to go out into the job world, your potential employers are looking for you. They want to see who you are and how you represent yourself for the world. Then about 50% of these searches result in an applicant being passed over for an opportunity, and that number is growing every day. A lot of companies today are hiring people specifically tasked to search for their applicants, even current employees, to see what they're putting out there, to see how they're representing themselves. And so I now have for you one of my favorite parts of the evening. And it is what I have found. Now normally, when I go to a school, I will search out their students, but I didn't do that this time. I was feeling generous. But I'm gonna share with you some really fun things that I have found over the last couple years as I've traveled around the country of how college and even high school students choose to represent themselves in the social networking world. So I'm gonna go ahead and click the little play button and just let you enjoy. You can hear a pin drop in here. This is awkward. were found really, really, really easily. It just took a quick search, and it, it kind of scares me, because I think to myself, if I were a potential employer or a school, and this is the first thing I found when I searched for you, what's that going to do for you? What's that going to say about you? Yes, it's fun to go out and have a good time. It's fun to enjoy life. I love life. I think life is the greatest thing in the entire world. I take advantage of it as much as possible to go out there and enjoy myself and have a good time. But it's taking that extra time to really think. Think about what we are putting out there for the world to see. Because today it's instant. Everything is instant. If I wanted to right now, I could snap a picture of all of you with my phone, upload it to Facebook like that without even thinking about it. It's taking that extra time. Even just a, a brief pause. Which is, I mean, compared to what <laughs> I used to have to go through whenever I took pictures. Because back when I was in like high school, we had the Kodak one-time use camera. Oh, you got 24, maybe 25 pictures. You'd be like, snap, click, click, click. Then you'd have to remember to take it to the pharmacy. And then like a month and a half later, you'd remember to pick it up. And you'd be like, oh, wow, pictures from that party. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you cut your hair. It looked awful. Now it's absolutely instant. You'd be like, click, oh, look at us sitting right there. <coughs> Two and a half seconds ago. We were so young. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with your hair. I'm so glad you owe. <laughs> take those few extra moments. Always take that time to think. Because again, it's so instant. We're used to everything being like that. I remember at one point the other day, I, I don't have cable, so I just watch everything on like Hulu and Netflix. And it was taking forever to load the new episode of Glee. And by forever, I mean like a minute. You know how frustrating that is? <laughs> it was the breakup episode. I wanted to know what was going to happen. Who was breaking up? Are you all caught up? 
Oh, it was heartbreaking. <sighs> but it was taking forever to load. And I just stop and think to myself, really, Josh? You are streaming this from space. It's going to take a second. <laughs> but it's remembering that. Sometimes it's not always going to be instant. And our actions should be the same way. Think before you upload. Think before you click. There's been plenty of times a friend of mine just got a new job and she was moving away from Boston down to Baltimore. And we went and we had a party with her at this really great place in Boston. And of course, pictures were taken. Now, here's the trick that I'm going to share with all of you. Whenever I'm at a party, I'm, you know, I'm 27 years old. I can do fun stuff. But I always look very dignified at parties. And it's actually my mom that pointed it out. She's like, you always look so proper. And that's because usually I take whatever is in my hand, be it a Bud Light or a glass of wine, and it just goes right behind my back. And if there's times when I'm caught in a candid moment, I say to my friends, hey, you know what, can I just see that before you upload it? If you have any photos of me, can you, can you check with me before you put it out there? And they say, yeah. So it's taking those few extra moments to really think about how we're using this technology and think about not only ourselves, but think about how we're representing our friends. Because your friends online, whenever they're posted on your wall, they're becoming that unofficial reference for you. And putting that much out there can get you into trouble. And in some cases, it leads to even more cases of bullying. So you're putting so much of that personal information and something that you might be th you think is a fun time with your friends. If I were to take one of those photos and print them out and post them all over one of those people's school, they're not going to have a good time with that. So it's really taking those few extra moments. And a lot of this is problems are coming from things like our phones. Phones today can do everything. It constantly amazes me. I have the Droid Incredible 2. It's brand new. I've already dropped it and broken it. <coughs> I got the insurance. Don't worry. They won't fix it, though. They said it was my fault. And it's so cool all the things our phones can do. And there, there are apps for everything. I don't have to go to the bathroom myself anymore. There is an app for that. <laughs> you can only use it one time, but, you know, if you've got the window seat on a long flight, it works. And it is really cool, but there's the problems that are coming from things from cell phones. One of the biggest issues has been the issue of sexting, which is, again, causing a lot of problems. And we're putting too much out there, and it's getting us in trouble. It's causing embarrassing situations. Now, one of the first stories comes out of a rural school in Pennsylvania, where some 14 and 15-year-old girls took some rather scandalous photos of themselves and sent them off to some older boys at school. Now, one of the boys is caught texting in class. Now, I, some of you, I was watching some of you text earlier. I, Good on you. It takes me forever to get a message out. I'm sitting there. Usually takes uh, both thumbs need to be involved. Some people, they're just like, buh, 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 buh. they're like writing a novel without even looking at it. If I tried to do that, it'd come out like harsh bark <laughs> in five minutes. <laughs> and so he was, he was, you know, doing his little under the desk texting thing. And he was, the phone was taken away for that reason. Now, when the teacher opened it up to turn it off, now you can set your wallpaper to whatever you want. So if you actually look at my phone, my wallpaper is my kitties. So kind. I'm a crazy cat lady. <laughs> Sometimes it's a sea turtle, depending on my mood. Yeah, when the teacher opened up the phone to turn it off, she didn't find a sea turtle. She found these photos, and these photos were eventually all discovered. Now, these girls, these 14 and 15 year old girls, are charged with manufacturing child pornography. These 15 year old, 16 year old boys are charged with possession of child pornography. Everyone involved in this particular story is now a registered sex offender. Think about that. At 14, 15, and 16 years old, their entire future is now basically set in stone. As they get older, start applying for jobs, the job runs a background check on them. Are they going to get it? Oh, absolutely not. So it's taking that time to think. Even the non-legal side of it. Let's say you're over the age of 18. You take one of these photos, you send it off to your boyfriend or girlfriend, and then you get into a fight. And they send it off to 10 of their friends. And 10 of their friends becomes 10 of their friends. And it just keeps growing and growing. The embarrassment, the shame. Again, take that time to think. Think about how your online actions are very much going to affect your reality. Because this type of bullying comes in all sorts of different forms. This is another form of it. <coughs> Embarrassing somebody, taking something embarrassing or priving it and putting it out there for the entire world. This is a lot of what happened in the Megan Meyer case. She revealed too much of herself. She revealed some personal things, some embarrassing things, and it was put out there. The same way a lot of these kids are. And they're putting themselves at risk. Because this isn't a school issue. This isn't a local issue. This is a federal offense. 
people are getting into a lot of trouble. This has been one of the biggest issues coming from cell phones, and it is really scary. The scariest part about all of it was in December of 2010, AARP, which you all know is the American Association for Really Old People, that's what it stands for. In their newsletter, they, they said they actually encouraged senior citizens to sex, to help boost their confidence, to help make them feel good about themselves. Nine times out of ten, when somebody gets caught sending these inappropriate pictures, it's because they sent it to the wrong contact in their phone. <laughs> if there was ever a reason to end this, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> but then there's the scary side of it. The... <laughs> The youngest reported case of sexting, the youngest reported case where the perpetrator had to register as a sex offender was a fifth grader. Fifth grader. So it's again, taking that time to think. Think about how we're utilizing this technology. Think about how it's going to affect your future. Because again, once it's out there, it is out there forever. And it is not going to go away. Because the truth of the matter is this, one in six teens have received a sex. One in six. That number is way too high. So it's again taking that time to think. So that's one in six that's putting something out there. One in six that's opening themselves up to a lot of trouble. So what can be done again? This is my advice and this comes from how I was raised. Again, my mom did a fantastic job. First, have conversations. Talk to each other. Talk to your kids. Find out what's going on. But make it a conversation. One thing I loved about what my mom did with us, she never yelled. She never lectured. She talked. So hold that conversation. Talk about what's going on. Make sure they understand. Monitor. Oh, technology. The evidence is right there. Monitor what's going on. Keep tabs on it. Remove the ability to do things. Kids that I've seen three-year-olds walking around with the new iPhone. I don't even have an iPhone, much less the new one. Why does the three-year-old need it? Are they calling Big Bird? <laughs> For now, while we have him? I'm sorry, I want that to get old. It hasn't. <laughs> Big Bird. But limit the abilities. Continue to stay knowledgeable. Again, find out what's going on in the world. Talk to each other. Help each other out. You know, you hear of a friend thinking, oh, Johnny wants me to send him a picture. Should I do it? Well, no. Take the time to think. Because what happens as you get older, Johnny gets mad at you, sends it off, or Johnny uploads it to Facebook, and it gets out there, and you apply to be a teacher. And then your students find that photo. How is that going to affect you? So taking that time to think, and think about how much we are putting out there. Because the problem with the internet today is we are putting a lot out there. And we want to make sure that we're always making that good first impression. So even things, something as simple as an email address can say a lot about a person. And I, over the years, have collected some very interesting email addresses. Things like Chatty Cathy, okay. Major Jerkface, okay. NYC Pimp. And Hottie Baby 365. Now I think to myself, I worked a lot. I work a lot with teenagers, and over the summer I worked with teen interns at the aquarium. There's something really great. But as I was going through applications, and I see something like NYC Pimp, that may be really funny to your friends. But how about to a potential employer? How about as you get older? If you throw that on a, a college application, do you think you're going to end up in Harvard? No, you're going to end up at Brown. No one's going to be happy. <laughs> oh, good. It's kind of an East Coast thing, but oh, we've all seen Family Guy. We get it. <laughs> so really even taking that time. So some examples that I like to put out there for really good ways to represent yourself in the email world, something as simple as your name. My email address, very easy and simple, info at joshgunderson.com. You cannot get more professional than that. Go me. 
Jay Smith at university, use, take advantage of your university email addresses. I, until the day that Salem State shut off my email, I was using it constantly. I love it. Even when I was applying for my new apartment, I did it for my aquarium email address. She didn't run my credit report because of that, which is a good thing. I'd be homeless. <laughs> Sally Mae. So something that simple, it can mean a lot. It can say a lot about who you are as a person. Or even, and I have a lot of friends that work in theater, I work in theater, say exactly what you want to do. Stage manager at gmail.com. I think they want to be a stage manager. Hire them. Really taking that time to see how you're putting yourself out there and what you are putting out there and who has access to it. And again, taking that time to think. Now, I spend a lot of time going through Facebook and seeing how people are putting themselves out there and representing themselves, and it's, it's gotten pretty ugly. So if I'm a potential employer and you've posted a status about your former boss, my boss is, has his blank up his blank, two more days and I'm out of here, no more blanks and horrible, we're just gonna basically go with horrible customers there. Now, if I'm a potential employer, I'm a future employer, and I find your social networking page, and I see you saying stuff like that, what are you going to say about me? I don't think I want you on my team. Or as you're filling out your Facebook page and you're putting all that professional information, and you've got a really great restaurant job, but you'll spit in somebody's food if they make you mad. I'm going to think twice, twice about hiring you. Even the photos that we're posting online, again, can get us into a lot of trouble. One of my favorite stories came from two girls that worked at a KFC that decided to show up one day in their bathing suits and go for a dip in the cleaning tubs oh. that they did their dishes in. And then they posted these photos on Facebook. Now, I don't know these girls. I'm not friends with these girls. I've never met them and probably never will. They're not here, are they? <laughs> cool. But I have these photos. They're out there. A quick Google search will pull them up. They lost their jobs. You think they walk into anyone's office hoping to apply for something, they're going to get that job? Probably not. So it's again taking that time to think, what are we putting out there for the whole world to see? Now this is one of my favorites. This comes out of a t small town outside of Little Rock, Arkansas. It happened on October 20th, 2010. Now October 20th of 2010 is now known as Spirit Day. And every year on that date or the equivalent, so this year it's actually this Friday, October 19th, it is Wear Purple Day. And that is Wear Purple in support of the kids of September of 2010 who took their lives because they were bullied. And Clis Mr. Clint McCants decided to post as his status, seriously, they want me to wear purple because five queers committed suicide. The only way I'm wearing it for them is if they all commit suicide. He went on to say a lot of nasty things. He even went on to say that if his own kids came to him and said that they were gay, he would disown them so fast. Mr. Clint McCants was the president of his local school board. I don't know Clint McCants, I've never met him, probably never will, hopefully never will. But here I have his status update. Now when I heard about this, I searched for him, and he's got some pretty high settings, I couldn't access his profile page, and that means one of his friends took this picture. One of his friends took this screenshot and posted it out there for the entire world to see. And this made international headlines. This was posted first thing in the morning. And that evening, he was on Anderson Cooper 360. He apologized for what he said, but it was too late. His family had to be moved out of the state and put into protective custody because of how many death threats they were receiving. He stepped down from his position at the school board, and he apologized. But it's out there. As Mr. Clint McCant starts applying for jobs, you think he's going to get them? <laughs> Probably not. Again, it's taking that time to really think. So there's been a lot of times when I've been really angry or frustrated, and I've wanted to post some nasty stuff. But taking those few extra seconds, sometimes I just type it out and delete it, because I need to get it out there. But once you hit that enter button, it is out there forever, and it's not going away. This was two years ago. I'm still talking about it, because I'm mad. So take those few extra seconds to think, and think about how your online actions are very much going to affect your future. And then even what kind of information we're giving away. One of the biggest things that I've noticed over the last couple of years is how much information we can give away without even thinking about it. So this is the story of Angela. 
a young girl who, through three status updates and a profile picture, I can tell you a whole lot about. So status update number one, Angela's parents are thinking about going out of town this weekend. We'll see how it goes. Not a lot there. All right. Next, it's official. Angela has the house to herself this weekend. Awesome. Last but not least, Angela's super pumped for the big game tonight versus the Titans, TGIF. Now, for you real youngins in the room, that's thank goodness it's Friday, which for us old folks means step-by-step -step and Doogie Hauser. Okay. So here it is. I have three status updates and a profile picture, and I can actually learn a lot. I now know that she's alone this weekend. I know that she has a game tonight. From her profile picture, I can see that she plays field hockey. She's number 99. Looks like she's the goalie. She lives in Paxton. There's a lot of information right there. And what Angela didn't realize is somebody was watching her account. And this guy could see all this information. So he was able to log on to her school's website in Paxton, find out when and where this game was, went to the game, recognized her, number 99, big bullseye right there on her chest. Cheered her on, it was a great time. Her team won, it was a huge victory. And afterwards, Angela wanted to head home and change before heading out to celebrate with her friends. He was able to follow her. Now before you get too concerned, this story has a happy ending. I wouldn't do that to you. She went home, locked the front door, set the alarm, went upstairs to take a shower. While she was in the shower, he broke in. She heard the alarm go off, locked herself in the bathroom, got a hold of 911. Police apprehended him, everyone's happy. The problem is the not so happy endings out there. And unfortunately, it's happening more and more. One story of a young girl in southern New Hampshire, about nine years old, logged on to Facebook and updated her status, heading out to the park to play with friends. Now, if you're like me, you notice two problems. One, why is a nine-year-old on Facebook? Stop it. Minimum age is 13. She's not there yet, but sh whatever. She lied about her age. Everyone does it. And she's revealing a little bit too much information. Because in this small town, there's only one park, one place that she could be. And much like Angela's story, somebody was watching her account, and he could see this information. And he went to that park, recognized her from her profile picture, and called her over to his car by name. He was able to convince her to get into his car. And she realized a little bit too late what her mistake was. He had broken off the locking mechanism on the door and had covered over the handle in duct tape. This story does not have a happy ending. And it's through something as simple as a status update. Something that we are putting out there for the entire world to see. So it's again, taking that time to think. Because we all know those people that are just constantly updating their statuses with every little thing that they're doing. That'll be enough of that. My mom is the worst. I just woke up. What should I have for breakfast today? It's going to be a beautiful day. The sun is shining. I can look outside my window. I know the sun's shining, mom, calm down. We're gonna go do this, we're gonna go do that. Oh. She's the worst. Oh, and she's the worst. One of my favorite stories about my family is my mom. My own mother. My mother. I do this for a living. My mom lost her job because of a Facebook status update. And I'm going to tell you the story. Maybe my mom thought about coming with me on this trip. It's probably for the best she didn't. <laughs> my mom works as an RN, and she was working at a um, psychiatric rehab hospital in Massachusetts. And one night, she was working the overnight shift, and this guy came in. He was just, boo-hoo. And he was screaming, I'm a sniper, I'm a sniper. He was, he, I don't know what he was on, but he had a good time with it. And it became a joke amongst the staff. And they were joke, always joking around the hallways, I'm a sniper, I'm a sniper. And so my mom, in her infinite wisdom, posted as a status update, I'm a sniper. And this immediately became a breach of patient confidentiality. And she lost her job. And then she hid it from me. Awesome role reversal. My sister finally told me. I went to my mom's house. I was like, Mom, there's something you want to tell me? <laughs> no, Mom. OK. Do I need to show you my PowerPoint? <laughs> she still hasn't seen it. And she does not know I tell this story, so that'll be enough. Does not leave this room. Or go ahead and let it. But it's taking that time to think about how this really is going to affect us and how it could affect your future, because she lost her job. That's very serious. Granted, she was probably on the verge of quitting anyway and found a better job, but it's out there. She's lost that reference. So again, taking that time to really think about what we're putting out there. 
And who has access to it? Because the reason her job even found out is because one of her friends on Facebook turned her in. And I said to my mom, Mom, you don't even like this woman. Why is she your friend on Facebook? Well, I need to keep tabs on her. How'd that work out for you? <laughs> because here's the reality of the Facebook world. Now, I, at the beginning of every year, do a survey of middle and high school students as well as colleges all across North America. That is the United States and Canada. And here's what I have learned. The average user on MySpace and Facebook, mostly Facebook, has at least 300 friends. Now, some have more, some have less. National average in this age group was around 300. Now, out of those 300 friends, about 30 to 40% of those friends, they had never met face to face. So they were complete strangers that have access to all of this information, complete access to them. And then, about 20 to 30% of those friends, they met face to face once. In addition to that, about 10 to 20% of those friends were people that they didn't even like. But it's a numbers game. The higher your number, the cooler you are. And you know, you want to think of it like, I don't know, a game of golf. The lower your score, the better. It's golf, right? Yeah. All right, cool. I was gonna, it was between bowling and golf in my head. I went with it. But it's really taking that time because it's those people, those bullies. You're giving them that access. Those creepers out there in the world, the people that are intending to do you harm, you're giving them that access. So my homework for every single one of you tonight, when you go home tonight, I want you to log on to your social networking pages, Facebook, MySpace, whatever, and clean up shop. Because each and every one of you that are on Facebook can probably get rid of at least 10 people. 10 people you don't know, 10 people you don't know that well, 10 people you don't even talk to. I, once a month, still log on to Facebook and delete folks. I currently have 197 friends as of today on Facebook. I know each and every one of them. One of my favorite rules to use, if they're not a contact in my phone, they're not a friend on Facebook. If I have never breathed the same air as them, been in the same room as them, they are not a friend on Facebook. Or even if they don't use it that often. I've got a lot of family members that signed up for Facebook, have no clue what they're doing, mom, and shouldn't be on there. So I remove them, because if something happens, their account get, gets hacked, somebody gets in there and accesses it, they now have access to me. So I remove them. Do that for yourselves. It's one of the smartest things you can do. If you don't like somebody, don't friend them on Facebook, even if it's to keep tabs. Because chances are they're keeping tabs on you, and they're looking at what you're posting, and they're looking for ways to use it against you. So. Also, looking at your settings is a big help. Now, these here are my actual Facebook privacy settings. I've got it set up to friends only. Only my friends have access. This is really easy to find. Upper right-hand corner, the little drop-down menu, privacy settings. Whoop, there it is. Yeah, late 90s songs. Nope, none of you? All right, cool. How people connect. If you were to search for my page, and a lot of people do, you're not going to find a whole lot. Even if you were lucky enough to find my personal page, you're not going to see anything. You're going to see my cover photo, because timeline forces you to do that. Thanks, Facebook. But that's about it. Learn how to lock up this information, how people can message you, how people can friend request you. Get those people out of your lives that you don't want there. If you don't want somebody connecting with you, get them out of there. Don't give them access. Don't give them ammo. Don't give them things to use against you. And we're putting a lot out there on Facebook. So get those people out of there and keep it locked up so they're not able to find it. And then ask yourself very simple questions. What I always ask myself before I post something, why am I posting this? Am I trying to be funny, controversial, political, whatever? Does it really need to be put out there? And if the answer is no, then I don't. It's taking those few extra seconds. Can it wait? If I want to joke around with my friends, maybe it's not going to translate very well. Maybe somebody might take it the wrong way. Can it wait till we're face to face? Is it too personal? Am I putting too much of myself out there? I've seen a lot of weird personal stuff posted on Facebook. One of my recent pet peeves is two of my friends got married. She didn't send out traditional invitations. She created a Facebook event. And then she didn't even invite me. How rude. But how weird. Because it was a public event. Everyone could see it. I could have crashed. I should have. Oh. Missed opportunities. But it's... Do you really want that out there? Do you really want something that personal out there? Is it too personal? Ask yourself that question. And then, of course, who's going to see this? Oh, take the time to think about that.
Because I have some of the highest settings possible on Facebook. Am I 100% safe? Absolutely not. Because there's always the risk. If I were to post something nasty and somebody takes a screenshot of it, much like they did to Mr. Clint McCants, how could that affect me? My reputation, my job, my future, my livelihood. So taking those few extra seconds, ask yourself these questions. It's going to help out a lot. If anything at all, that's what you got to do. And in the end, like I said, I wish I had all the answers. There's so much more to the online world. There really is. I, my record for talking about this was about three and a half hours. I'm not going to do that to you. It's Monday night football. Did I get that right? Yes. It's between that or X Factor, but that's Wednesdays. I wish I had all the answers. I really do. But hopefully, again, you have the information now. You have that inspiration to go out and really learn a little bit more, to find out what it is. Look up that bullying law. Find out exactly what your state is doing to keep you safe. Find out what's going on in your community. Is enough happening? Like I mentioned, October 19th, this Friday, it's Spirit Day. Wear purple. Wear purple in memory of those who felt like they had no one else to talk to, nowhere else to go as a way of speaking out and saying, you know what, not here. Show your support, find out what's going on, how you can help out. There's a lot of really great organizations out there. Take advantage of that. Bring that to your campus, bring that to your community. Say, hey, you know what? We wanna make a difference. What can we do? And do that, take advantage. And if there's nothing, create it yourselves. Spirit Day was started by a young girl, Brittany McMillan, young girl. She started this entire worldwide movement. I simply wear purple to show your support. Do that. Take advantage. So what I'm going to do now is I will open up to questions. If you don't want to ask any questions right now, by all means, feel free to email me. Like I said, very simple, either info at joshgunderson.com or inspire at campusoutreachservices.com. You can find my website, joshgunderson.com, or again, campusoutreachservices.com. You can find me on Facebook, not my personal page. Don't get too excited. It's a, it's a likable page, so you can like me. My mom doesn't even like me, so don't worry if you don't. Or you can follow me on the Twitter. I, I, I do tweet. I, I don't fully get it, because normally in my life, if somebody were walking around just spewing off random thoughts wildly, we called them a crazy person. Now they're a Twitter user, so whatever floats your boat. So are there any questions? <laughs> Why, Josh? Are there any questions at all, or have I just completely blown your minds? Bueller? Bueller? Really? <laughs> oh, new homework assignment. Y'all need to go home and watch Ferris Bueller's Day Off. You're all fired. Is that a hand I see? Yes. Yes! Oh, lights. The lights did change, right? <laughs> oh, thank you, sir. Hi. Hello, my name is John Paul, and my question is, um, what do you think would be a good way to start kind of spreading this around? Um, a lot of us are in college, actually all of us are in college, I'm sorry, I said that wrong, and we are all probably very inspired with what you said, and we want to do something about this. What would be a good way that we could do something in this time? Uh, I'm assuming you do have you know, groups and clubs and organizations on your campus? Someone give me a yes or no? Yes. yes, all right, awesome. Start something, start that movement. There are a lot of um, even nationwide organizations that are always looking for people to create something. There's the Ye Yellow Ribbon Foundation um, started um, for suicide prevention. Um, so you have that, you can start a chapter on your campus. There's um, GLAAD, which, oh, it's the complete meaning of that is escaping my mind, but they are actually the organization that sponsors Spirit Day. There's a lot of organizations out there, so just do your search, and if you, there's nothing that suits you, create something. Create an alliance organization that brings different people together to you know, say, we want to make a difference in our community. We at Salem State University had the group called the Alliance, and they brought in a lot of diversity programs. They worked a lot on campus to you know, bring a lot of outside stuff in and you know, really try to enhance the culture, learn about the world around them, and bring us all together. And they did a lot of work like you know, honoring Spirit Day, doing um, Blue Shirt Day, because October is actually anti-bullying month uh, worldwide. <coughs> so they would do um, a lot of events and stuff like that. So it's you know, 
search what's out there. Find what works best for you. Um, you know, most certainly if you have questions, get in touch. I, I'd love to be able to help out whatever you'd like to do. And just talk about it. Get a group of people together that are passionate and say, you know what, we want to make a difference and see this stop. And do that. Just use your voices. That's what you have. Use them. Any other questions? Bueller. I'm going to keep going to it because it's still funny to me. All right. Well, I thank you all very, very much for coming tonight. Have a great rest of your night. Enjoy. Students at TLU engage in high-impact educational experiences that include civic engagement, aesthetic expression, critical thinking, and a focus on intercultural knowledge in a community that welcomes the interplay of faith and reason.